Well, hello, ladies. Simone here, Director of Program Growth, and I'm with Stephanie Burke and Christine Rich, our friends from the Avila Institute, among many other things, as I've mentioned before. And we are so excited for this episode because we will be discussing the fifth dwelling place, the fifth mansion in Teresa of Avila's interior castle. So I don't know how we're going to get through it. We are obviously not going to do it justice because this is even St. Teresa said, I don't know if I can even talk about this because it is so personal, deep, intimate. Um, so, but we're gonna give, our, give it our best shot and, and see, see what happens. So ladies, where, do we, where should we begin with talking about this fifth mansion? I think we have to start with her prayer. We do, you see? <laughs> See, ladies, that's what I'm talking about. We're, we were just saying before this, uh, before we hit record, that saints run in packs, and that was just an example of how the saints, how spiritual friends, can help us, reminding us to pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let nothing upset you. Let nothing startle you. All things pass. God does not change. Patience wins all it seeks. Whoever has God lacks nothing. God alone is enough. St. Teresa of Avila. Pray, pray for us. us. Pray for us. In the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God alone is enough. <laughs> how, do we, how do you record a podcast on the fifth mansion when, when words are so limited? How do we do that? Well, we're going to do it. Right. And I'm excited to do it. This is really, I don't know about... I mean, for me, I don't know about the two of you, but for me, this has been very um, inspiring and it's taken me to very deep places. I'm so grateful. And I hope that everybody that's, you know, joining us, I hope that it's really making an impact on your Lent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I have to echo that. Um, and I, I may have mentioned this when we first started recording this series, but I remember years and years ago picking up um, you know, the interior castle and getting about, you know, the second chapter, throwing it down and going, okay, I'm out. This is way beyond me. I cannot, I, I can't even begin to comprehend this. And what I like about this, uh, as I was passing uh, my husband in the hall, I stopped him and I said, I really like the way in Dow has unpacked this. And I find it to be very understandable, you know, because they take time to, you know, break it down and it's just really well done. So kudos to Endow for bringing this to life and unpacking it in a way that we can um, grasp it, even if we're not experiencing it. You know, what is this beautiful prayer, this relationship, this union we're all called to? Um, because we're, we're all called. We may not all experience it in the same way, we, but she says we're all called. We just may receive different giftings along the path. But I love that the Lord granted her the grace to put down, to give her enough words to put it down. And um, I don't know if, if either of you have been uh, where it, in Spain where they have some of her items, but I actually saw the board where she would sit on the floor and it, it was just a palette. It was just, and it was worn smooth because she just sat there on her, you know, and, and wrote and wrote and wrote. And uh, it was pretty remarkable because the, even the poverty of her posture writing on that board was really awesome. You know, I, I wanted to touch it, but we couldn't get to it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the gift. I was very close to Avila when I was in Spain, but we weren't able to go. And I thought it was so tragic because I yeah. was so close and we weren't yeah. able to make it happen. Well, here's what she says in this chapter. She says, oh, sisters, how can I explain the riches and treasures and delights found in the fifth dwelling places? I believe it would be better not to say anything about these remaining rooms, for there is no way of knowing how to speak of them. Neither is the intellect capable of understanding them, nor can comparisons help in explaining them. Earthly things are too coarse for such a purpose and when you were when you were speaking stephanie i was thinking how amazing is it that these mansions which are the passive right in the first three there's the by human effort then we have the fourth which is that transitional awkward phase of like moving out of human effort into just receiving from god and now we're into the supernatural and you know just she couldn't she couldn't have written it without god 
really inspiring her to do it. And to especially, I would say, to write about the, these, man, these supernatural mansions, the last three. Yeah, absolutely, right. Well, she is moving us into the distinction between the prayer of union and the prayer of quiet. So we, we come out of the prayer of quiet. And, um, you know, we, we, just as a reminder, in the prayer of quiet, our intellect, our memory, our imagination are still free to maneuver. You know, they're still active. Uh, we might be deep in prayer. We're we are experiencing some supernatural graces but we're, we're always aware of what's happening. And so the Lord use, utilizes memories, intellect, imagination to, um, to draw us deeper into that prayer. But as we move into the prayer of union, all of our human faculties are completely immersed in the Lord, right? And, and it says, in other words, our prayer is deeper, more intense, and more focused as the spiritual delights that God may choose as his spiritual delights that God may choose to bestow on us. So the deeper he draws us in, we may completely lose ourselves in prayer and come out somewhere 20 minutes, 30 minutes later. We don't realize what's happened. We've had a loss of time, but we are sure that we were with the Lord. That's, that's one of the distinctions of understanding if it was of God or not, is that we're sure of it. Like it, it's something that resonates deep within us. And um, part of that happens in, is because the Lord starts to work passively within us. Um, you know, sometimes people say, well, I don't know if anything's happening. You know, I don't know if, 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 if this prayer is working, right? Because th the enemy can tempt us to doubt, you know, and he can tempt us to say, you know, you're not really doing anything. You might as well give this up. This is all fake. Nothing's happening, you know, and we can doubt ourselves in that. But where we can see it is the fruits of our lives. So we can ask our husband, our brother, our sister, our mother, our, our best friend, our spiritual director, am I better than I was a year ago? You know, not better in the sense of nicer, but rather do you see an increase of virtues, right? And so that's one of the ways that we can determine it. Um, so she says here that, you know, we're, it's a greater time where we really need to die to self-love and to, a, to the attachments of the world. And that in this time where we can see our, um, this transition of virtues will come through the love of neighbor um, and a, a deeper love in general of, of all that we're, we're trying to live out um, so, and it's all deeper humility, deeper detachment, and love of neighbor, the three virtues that we're really wanting to grow in. Can I ask you a question, Stephanie? So, that seems to be fruits of the prayer of quiet that dispose oneself to, because we can properly say in the fifth mansion that this is contemplative prayer. With the prayer of quiet, we can call that meditation or mental prayer, but this is now we can really say this is contemplative prayer. This is beyond. Beyond. beyond everything and one of the distinctions we can make because the in the in the ignatian um in the ignatian realm of prayer of of that uh what do you call it spirituality ignatian spirituality they'll use the word contemplative mm -hmm. that's that's meditation really mm -hmm. that, you know you're you're actively involved you're still in this kind of prayer of quiet where everything's engaged and you're actively seeking this out it's a gift but it's also we're, we're actively engaged in it right. what the distinction we can use is infused contemplation so we use the, the word infused to make that distinction and so it helps us when we're talking to our nation we're translating <laughs> between jazz and, and carmelite yeah. right right, right. It, right. Is, it is tricky so i'm really grateful for the for that distinction because yeah there we're talking i use contemplation to assume the infused but you know so that but that's not always the case as you were saying so that's that's really right. important. and i've definitely had the evil ones say oh you're wasting your time like you think god's here with you but he's not you could be doing laundry right now or whatever it is that you need to be doing i've definitely and and i think you know e e even beyond um i mean I, you, of course like you want people to notice like yeah there's a piece about you you you're different hopefully they're seeing a change in you um, but I think we can also say that if I show up with God, like God is more, more here than I'm here. So 
if I'm, you know, and so that I can trust in that too, even if it feels like I'm wasting time or, you know, right. like shove the devil away. So, yeah. And well, and can all, you uh, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was going to ask, I was going to ask if you can kind of help us or either, if either of you could help me and help others understand. Um, because I think that when we, when people really start to pray and you are in say that more um, like meditative state, you know, you feel like you're getting, you really know you're, pr it's like, you know, you're praying. Cause like, if you're, you're reflecting on the gospel and all of a sudden something comes to you, right. You're like getting these ideas. Then, then you move to this place where you kind of start questioning, am I doing it wrong now? Because that stuff's not happening anymore or this, and time is passing. So I'm still just trying to look for the distinction between that quiet and now a prayer of unity um, where it got quiet and I'm questioning and I'm wrestling with what's happening. And now like, how would somebody say, Oh, this is, you know, and I think you said it by the fruits, but so at the end of your prayer, like you said, of 20, 30 minutes have gone by and you're like, I'm sure I was with God, but yet it's very different because I don't, I can't tell you, Oh, you know, on this gospel, what if he was talking about this? Or what if Jesus did this? Or what if, he, you know, it, that's not there anymore. Right, um, right. So, but you I know, don't know. Sorry, but, but you know, I think what Stephanie, you were saying was like, you're sure that you were there. Right. And, and it's, it's also, we need to understand that, um, that, that there will come a transition into this kind of prayer. And I, and I didn't see it noted here. It's a type of bridge where an aridity comes into our prayer, right? So all the former ways that we used to pray don't work anymore, right? So we, we wanna meditate on a passage. Uh, we write in our journal and we're just having all these outpourings of love and thoughts and prayers and you know whatever it is. Those things aren't happening, which all involved imagination, intellect, you know, our faculties, right? When we go into the prayer of union, there will be, there won't be images. It's completely lost in time. It's as if you're suspended. And then when you come out of it, the fruit of that is peace. You know, she even here it says, contemplation is an infused experience of the presence of God that gives light to the soul and warmth to the heart. It is given prayer, the spirit praying within us. You know, and that's the thing. It's, it's the Lord praying in us, which is just so beautiful and so divine. So we find ourselves entering in time, kind of a sleep-like state in which all of our faculties are completely unaware of themselves and of the things of the world, right? And in this encounter, God removes everything but himself in our consciousness, Okay. So we, we can't compare it. It's, it's beyond words. It's, it's why she says, you know, I don't even know how to describe this, how I even begin to describe it, but there it is, you know, right? And so um, she says, the distinction is that we can't do this on our own. It's a gifted thing. All we can do is prepare for it. And then the Lord does the work, which I think is kind of, um, is a nice bridge over into the silkworm analogy that she yeah, uses. That's that what I, I was going to bring up. Yeah, that's what I was going to bring up. Is that, um, yeah, so keep going because that's what okay. I wanted to well, hear about. Can I, can I say something really quick? Sure. I have a friend that I'm glad you mentioned the aridity and the bridge thing because I was talking to a friend recently and, and she said that over COVID, her usual ways of praying, like listening to a praise and a worship song and like letting that get her into that supernatural space and all, she, it's just not working anymore. She's like, it mm -hmm. just doesn't. The, the old way so the, almost the exact word that you use Stephanie is almost exactly what she said like it's just not working anymore what's going on here but Teresa is explaining what's going on which is awesome yeah it's really it's really phenomenal and that's why spiritual direction works so well yeah. you know I and it's just so helpful to have somebody outside of us that can look in and help us kind of diagnose you know I was talking to a beautiful holy woman um, not too long ago and she said I just think I'm you know attached to my coffee she said, I think my coffee is getting in the way. And she kept saying her coffee and she's describing this stuff that I was trying to meditate. I can't journal anymore. Anything that I used to do does it, you know, and I just kind of looked at her and I took a moment to prayer and I said, it's not your coffee. Thank you God know, your you coffee. said that. <laughs> 
I'm sure so she was really we went into this teaching, right? And then she she texts me the next day after prayer time, and she went, "Oh my goodness, you're right. It wasn't my coffee." You know, a total total change because she rested. She rested in this time, and she allowed the Lord to pull her into prayer and to pray within Him. And she quit fighting. You know, she quit trying to arm wrestle. Don't arm wrestle the Lord. Let Him love you. Yeah. You know, let him love you. Be We, especially as women, we have this beautiful gifting in that we are built to receive. The, the very name woman means open. It means open. We are built to receive. So we, we can use that gifting when we go to prayer and let the Lord pour himself out upon us, in and through us, mm -hmm. and, and draw us to the heights of prayer if we prepare ourselves for it, right? One of the things that, that I want to caution on it, however, is that you need to do a deep examine if you're going through aridity. You have to make sure that you haven't become slothful in some of your ascetical practices if you haven't slipped into, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, it, it, just to use some examples, scrolling on your phone for endless hours, um, any kind of other, you know, venial sins or imperfections or weaknesses that are starting to creep in. And even Teresa's talking about it in this, she said, this is a tenuous time. You know, we're entering into a betrothal time with the Lord. We must be vigilant. He wants everything. Yeah. The Lord is- And that vigilance also prepares us, right? It's what girds us up. It's what is, it's what he uses to, to make us stronger. Right, right. And, it, and it's what we're talking about in the silkworm analogy, right? So this, this little worm, you know, and I love that it's a worm because, you know, <laughs> you know we, can, we can say, oh, who am I? I'm nothing but a worm. I don't know which saints have all said that, but people go, I'm not a worm. Yes, you are. You're a worm. In comparison to the Lord, you're a worm. <laughs> and, and so this little worm goes and, and he starts by his efforts to build the cocoon around himself. So he's drawing himself in. He's making this little, in fact, he's making his little sacred space. He's got his little sacred time. He's building all around him. You know, he's creating this darkness. I, I pray in the dark. I have, a, I have a space that's meant just for prayer. I have a chair that's just for prayer. And I go into my little cocoon and I sit there with the Lord, with my lit candle and it's just me and him praying. So we go into that space and within that, the Lord, I love what she says here. It says, um, where did I find it? It was really, really beautiful about the silk form. And I want to, um, oh, I think it's here. Let's see where he, let's see. Uh, mm, I want to think, okay, I may have to just describe it. Is it but um, it's, um, after I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, after experiencing this profound union with God, was that what you were looking for? Um, it's where he enters into the center of that cocoon, right? So, so it's the little worm prepares by efforts, right? But then the Lord enters into that little cocoon um, as if he's passing through the, da the door up into the upper room. Like unknown. oh yeah, that was so good. I thought that was so how good. Wizard is that analogy that here we are in our little cocoon, and the Lord comes in to meet us there, to purify us, to love us, to draw us to Himself, to passively purify us, and and there is no door. He just passes and he goes into that that area of our soul. Really exquisite um, analogy that I think was just really really beautiful. That that touched me deeply too. It's like, oh my gosh, he's gonna come. Yeah, he's coming into. This is how he comes in, right? And the and that veil, or whether the veil comes down or he walks right through it. It's just uh, it's like so brilliant and a beautiful analogy. Well, yeah. and worms have their own beauty, but our destiny is to be these beautiful, you know, colorful yeah. creature butterflies. So you know, the natural to the supernatural. Right. Very awkward being natural beings that have a supernatural destiny. And I love, I love that about these mansions is that she, she takes into account just the, tra the, 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 the transition phases and the vigilance 
because it is strange to be natural creatures having a supernatural destiny and to live a supernatural life while trying to also stay grounded in natural life. I mean, it's weird, uh, but it's wonderful. That's right. So with this, with the, uh, with, so I guess we should probably talk a little bit before we close this episode about the love of neighbor, because mm -hmm. now there's a distinction between true union as opposed to the prayer of union. So we can always have true union with God, um, even if we aren't given the prayer of union. And, and so, yeah. Well, she says, unless we get completely derailed, we will all experience the prayer of union. Wow. We just may not realize it. Oh, and, nice. some, and we may and, not have the same experiences, right? He may give us different experiences, maybe than she's even describing. Well, in the prayer of union, a prayer of union is passive. We won't, it, it's, uh, unless we awake from it and we, and we know, where do we see the fruits? We can't wait to tell, the, tell, tell our story. We can't wait for others to experience God. I mean, you can look at people and they're completely transformed. One of the indicators is they're no longer the person they used to be, right? They're no longer who they used to be. Um, and, and, you know, I, I know a person that went through this prayer and they kind of look back over their life and they're going, wow, you know, I don't even recognize myself anymore. Like, yeah. I'm not that person. That person had this vice, this vice, this vice. What's beautiful about the prayer of union is the Lord often heals those vices in an instant. Yeah. You know, the things that they used to suffer from or struggle with, whether it's weaknesses or imperfections or a particular venial sin or even a mortal sin, the Lord can choose to bring this prayer of union. They don't even realize it's happened. And it can t happen in an instant and it can purify them of something and, and bring them. I mean, it's, it's his, it's, it's his uh, desire to do so. Um, so it's, it's really, really quite exquisite. Um, I, I love that. And I also think the way that we, sh like a, a certain c Christian culture we can cultivate is to say, oh, that was me last week right? Like I, I can change. I, and I can change fast is what you're saying, Stephanie. And if that's what God wants. So, you know, uh, Christine, you always love to like bring us to the practical, which I really appreciate. Um, and one of them is at least, I, I don't know if somebody might benefit from this, but when I go to confession, I will ask for the graces I want for things. I'll, and uh, because I know that God can get, grant them if he wants. And if I'm in confession, being healed of brokenness and being healed of sin. And I like the graces, you know, and I don't know, I don't think this is taught, but this is what I do. I'd like graces to overcome this or this vice or that weakness or that venial sin or whatever it is. Ask for it all. Yeah. If I could say, I was going to share, cause you're, you're, it was, your things were coming to my mind about even myself. And I'm not saying where I am, you know, in my prayer life or, but, but I, I remember I used to sit in church this, years ago. I used to sit in church and I could look around and I wondered, wow, why can't these people be more like me? Look at me here. <laughs> look at me sitting in quiet. Look at me praying. Look at, they're all chatty. They're doing this. They're doing, you know, and. What she's uh, wearing. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. All, all kinds of things. Right. And. Now I sit and if I look around the church, I'll think, wow, look at, you know, and the people that I used to, you know, think of, I mean, they might even be the very same people. I see them very differently. And I see, you know, it's like almost like having a, um, the eyes of Jesus, you know, and I, again, I'm not, I'm not trying to say I have those or what, but I feel like I have been given this gift to look at people very differently now. And I think that has to do with, this um, love of neighbor and what, you know, what Teresa talks about here, how do we come to this? How do we even start working towards perfection? And she says it's clearly in the scriptures that we have to love God with all of our, with our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength, and love our neighbor as ourself. Mm -hmm. And so I made note here, I'm like thinking, wow, these two laws to, to love, you know, love God with all our heart, mind, soul, strength, and to love neighbor of ourselves, those, if we could do those two things, that that would be perfection. 
And mm -hmm. then, you know, that therein lies the, you know, union with God. And I remember when this, when I, um, when Deuteronomy 4 really sunk in one day and I was sitting with some friends and I, I remember looking at them and saying, wow, what would the world look like? What would the world look like? Not even everybody else. What, what would the world look like if I loved God with my whole heart, with my whole mind, strength, soul? Like, how would things change around me? I mean, that was a profound moment. So I was like, I don't think I'm doing, I could tell you I'm not doing that because I can tell you by, you know, what's happening in my life. And I could tell you about the people around, you know, in my life. And I'm not, you know, again, how I'm seeing people. Um, so grace, sorry, Christina, yeah. was, what an incredible grace, because if you're having that thought, how would the world change if I loved better? That seems to be a, a grace of, and I intend for you to love better. <laughs> And I'm going right. to, and, and I'm just letting you know what's happening. This is what's going to happen because like, I think Stephanie, maybe you said this in the second episode about the battles of the mind, right? Like God trying to change your mindset, like, and he plans that idea. What if I loved better? And I loved what, in the study guide where um, it says, uh, this is how in Teresa's mind, we strive for perfection in this life by simply loving our neighbor. She knows, mm -hmm. however, that despite our best efforts, this is not humanly possible. I mean, this is why there's so much of the church is like plagued with moralism because I'm striving so hard to love so hard, but I haven't received anything. So how can I give what I haven't received? How can I love if I'm not immersed in the lover? And I mean, really love, not just doing good actions because that doesn't, that's not Christianity. Christianity right. is not that. So I, and I, you know, I, it was really, it was really Cardinal Ratzinger, Pope Benedict the 16th that said so well in his book, what it means to be a Christian you know, that, that despite all my best efforts, I get to the point and I'm butchering Ratzinger, sorry. What I get to the point where I realize that I need to be given something too. And this is mm -hmm. where Jesus fills in the gap and completes my love in a way that I cannot. Right. Because we look at these ideals, right. Of humility, love of neighbor, and, and we're striving of our own human capacity, right. To, to do that. Oh, I know this is right. I'm supposed to be humble. I'm supposed to love my neighbor. But she says plainly, she said, without God's help, it is impossible to love others in a sacrificial way. And we may want to do great things, but if we fail to love those closest to us, our great plans amount to nothing. And, and we need to understand, and, and I've had so many conversations about this because people you know, they'll, they'll want to love deeply and, and they want to, you know, they get inspired by the love of God and they want to change the world. And so they're thinking about these great projects and, you know, all these things right out there, they're going to change the world. The truth is our neighbor are those people that are in our family that have been given to us. And in some of those people we've chosen and they have a ring on their finger and they're not supposed to go anyplace else. And that is our neighbor, right? And, and, and it's like, you can say, oh, well, but that's where we need to die to ourselves the most. That's where we need to love sacrificial, sacrificially, heroically. And, and we tend to sometimes do this little, you know, skirting the issue. Oh, oh but you know, cause, cause it's hard. It's hard. It's hard to die, your, die to yourself a million times. But she says, if we don't do this, we cannot claim the love of God yeah. because the Lord will hold us accountable. And that's the thing. He's a beautiful, merciful, generous God, but he exacts a price. And we must live that call. We have to live that call. Well, it's so unglamorous, right? It's much, it's much more glamorous to have like a big you know, project with a press release about all the awesome things that you're doing. And then, you know, Mother Teresa being like, you need to go home and love your family. That's, that's, that's your, you know, that's your Calcutta. That's your Calcutta. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I just love what, and I was talking to a gentleman the other week, actually, and he's been just so afflicted with, you know, I need to do something big for the Lord. Look at all these people who are doing these big things and da, 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 da. And then we were having a coffee and he said, I, I realized something, this was beautiful. Was a, I was, I felt so privileged to, to hear this from him directly. He said, I think my job is to, is to be present to my wife and my children. I think that's my big thing. I was like, I agree. I think you're right. It was so beautiful to like watch him come to that. And that's not a small, that's no small thing. 
That's no, no, it's miraculous. It is. Because I can tell you that most people don't think about it. They become very complacent in their marriages and then they wonder why they're falling apart. Yeah. And that is why the enemy strives so hard to destroy marriages. I mean, that is our call. That's yeah. our call. And, and we, it's where we're called. So, um, as we're kind of wrapping up this chapter, because I know we're, we're under kind of a time constraint here, I don't want us to fail to mention another part of this beautiful mansion, and that's courtship. You know, we all, since we were little girls, uh, probably most of us listening to this podcast, were unfortunately raised on Disney, where our prince was going to ride in on a, on a horse, and we were going to look amazing, and he was going to be charming and awesome. Well, guess what? The Lord Jesus is our prince in shining armor, and he's amazing. And he will never fail us, and his love is perfect. Um, so he is calling us to this beautiful uh, courtship during this time, and it's marked by the flame of love. And she she talks about it. It's as if the two lovers come together and they meet one another, and then they exchange a gift, and then they spend time with one another, and they meet each other's you know families, and it's this constant drawing towards each other. Um, but we're we're constantly needing to. Um, detach ourselves from external t attachments and surrendering our innermost selves to him during this courtship part. He's drawing us close and he wants all of us, right? He's preparing us for spiritual marriage, but it's going to exact a price. Um, and she said that we're going to, we need to be assured that there will be many temptations that are going to come that the enemy is still working, he's still alive and well. Um, and that even in this state, the soul is not so strong that it can place itself in the occasions of sin, right? Like you have to be vigilant and you can be completely in love with the Lord. You're kind of floaty all the time. Um, you know, I this, this woman came to one of my prayer meetings one time and she walked in and she goes, I feel like I have a new boyfriend because she was in love with the Lord. He was just all over her. It was so cute. She'd been married 40 years. You know, she comes in and she's in love with the Lord. Um, and, and in that time, it's very beautiful, but it's, a, it's still a very tenuous time. And we must be vigilant to keep all occasions of sin and be constantly looking because the enemy's always seeking to draw us out. Amen. That's a great. Amen. That's a can great, and yeah. can I just um, read that last bit of her quote of Teresa's quote from that because I think that it's pretty important because um, she was talking about how um, let's see His Majesty, which she calls Jesus as his. Oh no, sorry, that's the wrong. That's the wrong quote. Let me look here. Um, she was talking about these concerns and about how how we're there and we think everything is all good and she said then little by little. He darkens the intellect, cools the will's ardor, and makes self-love grow until one way or another, he withdraws us from the will of God and brings us to his own. So this is the enemy. Thus, we have an answer to, our, to the second doubt. There is no enclosure so fenced in that he cannot enter or desert so withdrawn that he fails to go there. And... Um, she was and she's really speaking of you know again staying sharp not and the the biggest thing is not giving in to self-deception like yep. we are that that we we can we sit back and we're like i am all good look at me look at all i'm doing look what's i and and that um self-deception and there's a phrase help me out about that that um so we, we need to, so she, and she talks about this time and time again, till our last breath, we need to grow in self-knowledge. Yeah. And so that self-knowledge comes through the trials. So during this time of prayer is very beautiful, very mystical, but it comes from, a, it will also come with many trials exteriorly and interiorly. And we'll be talking about that in the next episode. But we must always grow in self-knowledge. This temptation happens or, or this trial has happened. I reacted this way. That's my weakness. I need to guard against that. I need to be purified. I need to take that to the Lord and ask for the graces that Simone asked, that the Lord strengthen me in this area and perfect me and shore up that place. So 
and be really open to that, right? Be open to that self-knowledge, be aware, be ready to, yeah. And, and then she says at the end also, do not fear. And do not I was, fear. I was just, I'm so glad you said, because that's what I was just going to make sure, like, this sounds we'll end on that. scary, but don't be, right. don't be afraid, because once mm-hmm. you have that encounter of love, hopefully, like that woman you're describing, Stephanie, you feel so loved, now you're safe, you're in a safe space to go into the self-knowledge stuff, where you can kind of look at those not cute things and go, okay, it's okay, it's okay, there's a butterfly that's going to emerge, <laughs> but I got to go through it, no shortcuts, what is Tolkien that's saying, right. shortcuts make long delays. So let's get to it. Mm -hmm. Until next week, ladies, read chapter eight for next time.